Oh, I remember six o'clock closing. I was around at that time. I was at Varsity at the times of six o'clock closing. I'm just old enough to remember six o'clock closing, and it was quite a ritual. All the workers, of course, who finished work at five o'clock, had an hour to uh, have a drink or two, and the idea was to sort of get to the front, of, get to the bar, and get get to the front, and several jug, sort of jugs or, or, or jars of beer to uh, sustain you for the for the hour, and then of course six o'clock, everybody was out, and had to find one's way home, one way or another. I can still see uh, a big pub in um, uh, Vulcan Lane, just off Queen Street, uh, with these guys with hoses and squeegees um, um, cleaning out the, uh, uh, the bar around about 6.30 after the uh, final patrons had, uh, had departed. Well, one of the problems with six o'clock closing was that everybody was in a rush to get beer down. They didn't have much time from the time they finished work to the time that the six o'clock came round. And um, that led to a lot of spillage and um, a lot of people bumping into each other and everything like that. I mean, of course, in those days, you couldn't afford to be choosy. I mean, you were lucky to get to the front of the queue in the, in the bar and um, you weren't going to sort of waste time sort of, well, you didn't have a choice anyway. It was either D.B. Brown or Lion Red. They were the main brews. But um, yeah, it's amazing, I guess just what New Zealand accepted it. Partly because of the six o'clock swill, you had to pour, the breweries had, or the publicans had to pour an awful lot of beer in a short period. So they had the taps. People from overseas were fascinated by this, the long plastic tubes with, with uh, taps on the end of it, pouring beer into glasses and jugs. Um, so it meant that you got a very, very bland product. And of course you had the big hoses that could be trundled around and fill uh, people's um, glasses or their uh, their jugs um, and they used to be dispensed in, in a, out of a one inch hose and uh, pass the jugs back and fill them up. Jugs became uh, common in the late 50s and into the early 60s. They were quite a lethal weapon and there were more than uh, two or three uh, pubs in Auckland known as the Flying Jug. Uh, as men would get um, plastered, uh, a jug or two would uh, fly around the place. And so you had to be careful where you stood um, for fear of uh, cutting your uh, feet. My, my recollection of the, um, I guess I hadn't really developed a taste for beer at that stage. And I, I recall it was fairly insipid. Um, it certainly didn't, in my view, compare to this, the range and quality of the beers that we, we have today. It was just fast drinking and um, not very civil, and uh, it was good that it disappeared. Six o'clock closing goes in 1967. The hope was that the men would have a little beer and then realise that they could come back again later, go home, come back again later uh, and drink, but I think the, uh, all the uh, best wishes of, uh, of the matrons of, uh, of uh, the country uh, didn't really come to pass. Uh, booze was just more readily available <laughs> than it had been. Don't fancy driving that hut road tonight. A couple of beers, please. New Zealand's public bars used to be the sacrosanct retreats of men alone. Now, most bars welcome women in their enclaves, but they still serve the prime purpose of providing a man with his favourite panacea for a day's work. Oh, that's a good drop. More communication occurs within the walls of a pub than practically anywhere else, although it may not all be remembered the next day. One of the most influential people in modern New Zealand brewing history was Doug Myers. Uh, Myers comes from a famous Auckland family um, and quite a character. Um, he didn't drink much because he had hepatitis as a young man, but he spent a lot of time in Europe and he understood the alcohol industry. He worked in France uh, and England, came back to New Zealand, moved into the family business. I didn't particularly want to come back to New Zealand and uh, maybe if pressure had been put on, 
I wouldn't have. And maybe my father was uh, smarter than I might have thought at the time. I guess over time I worked in England for three or four years after I left university. And I didn't feel English. I didn't at that stage want to stay there, although I liked it very much. And so I really came back, I guess, from default as, as much as anything else. He was the grandson of Arthur Myers, who'd been in, involved in brewing in New Zealand earlier and was a mayor of Auckland, and uh, the son of Sir Kenneth Myers. He was educated in Cambridge. He came back to New Zealand and he modernised the industry here completely. It was a very stultified, stuffy kind of industry with uh, bad product or inadequate product, in my opinion. I have thought of myself as connected to the past, but I've, ne I've had a high sense of dissatisfaction. And I think that's what's allowed me to focus more of my views and thoughts on the future and the appropriateness of whatever it is that one's doing to the present and the future rather than to try and hark back on to you know, what happened in previous generations. And I think in life if you haven't got a high sense of dissatisfaction, for some reason you've got to go and find one. Long story short, he helped set up New Zealand Wines and Spirits. And New Zealand Wines and Spirits were in a partnership with uh, New Zealand breweries around a uh, distribution deal. A complex series of events, but Myers had a buyout clause with New Zealand breweries if he ever chose to sell New Zealand wines and spirits. When he did that, there was a discussion on price or an argument on price which went to arbitration. New Zealand breweries wanted to pay him a handful of million dollars, seven or eight million dollars. Myers wanted in the realm of 20 to 24 million dollars. Arbitration was taking a long time. Myers, in the absolute gamble of his life, with over $20 million borrowed from overseas, launched a daring raid on Lion, effectively picking up 20% of the company in an overnight raid in November 1981. That put him in a powerful position. He was the single biggest stakeholder in the company and eventually put himself in as managing director and changed the face of brewing in New Zealand as we know it. Some people said he did it rather ruthlessly, but he did it, and he, he combined the the company into one unit. Uh, unit. Then he uh, bought, he went international, he bought companies in Australia, he bought Tui's, Castlemaine and others. But management generally was of a very low order in New Zealand because so much of the things that managers have to manage today was in fact managed by others. The government, the unions, circumstances. You didn't actually have to do that. You only had to open the door at nine o'clock, shut it at five. Uh, what he did was, first of all, he um, modernised the industry here, modernised the equipment. Douglas came in and his intention was to improve the efficiencies of the breweries, uh, improve productivity and improve quality. Um, and to that end, he was able to get capital spend, so he was able to persuade the board to spend money to upgrade a lot of facilities, for instance, Auckland in the 80s, mid-80s, spent a lot of money on uh, new packaging equipment and two new fermentation cellars as well. He also brought out an American, Chuck Hahn, who was a, an American brewer, to try and modernise brewing, the taste of beer in New Zealand. Chuck was employed by the company for a period of time and Chuck was one of the people who drove that capital expenditure program uh, to improve our capability in making high quality products. Uh, Douglas was very interested in um, the scientific development and research into brewing and so it had a profound effect on brewing in New Zealand. When I sold out earlier this year that was really the, you know, the view I took. My kids are quite young. If they go into business would they want to go into in that business? They probably wouldn't. Why would I want to impose it upon them? Probably I wouldn't. So whatever they want to do they're going to have a fair set of choices.
ironically, given that a lot of the early brewers in this country were German, and which which is has got a fine brewing tradition along with Belgium, um, somehow the quality of the German beer had been lost in this um, in um, Kutz's uh, continuous fermentation. No, I, I, I think that's so quite incorrect. In, in fact, the, the beers that we were making in those days were the beers that people wanted to drink in, in New Zealand. And uh, the fact that both DB and Lion were, were similar um, showed that that was the style of beer that they, they liked to have. That was They were called the New Zealand Draft and the New Zealand Lager beers. Dominion breweries did start to uh, produce lagers uh, they still weren't very hoppy, but they were lagers. Uh, but by and large, until the 1980s, there was very little variation in New Zealand beer, the taste of it. It tended to be warm, it tended to be brown, and it tended to be sweet. It's what you've got. I know. They say it's the same, you get the same legacy in um, America where they say a lot of the American beers like Budweiser are very light and pale, still the biggest selling beer in the world. So, um, and it's because people like it. We developed our, our brewing styles independently of everybody else in the world. And so we developed our own particular style and that's what we've brewed with. It's, it's a very, quite a complex issue and it's hard to know exactly where uh, you know, the, the tipping point or, or what it is that made things change. But when you consider what we've gone from, from a nation, from a beer drinking nation, which had a choice of sort of two, to one where we have so many at our disposal, um, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine that we were ever so starved of that sort of choice. And, and that we have tolerated such a, su such a, a low quality of beverage anyway. These days, of course, there's a bigger comparison now because you've got the craft beers that come in and a lot of people could then say, well, yes, compared to the craft beers, um, they are bland. Well, they've got four times the hops and also they've got twice the alcohol. So I think there is going to be a difference. One of the most critical uh, developments in New Zealand's modern brewing history was in 1981 with the formation of Max Brewery in Stoke Nelson. The McCashin story is really awesome because it's um, someone seeing an opportunity and that would have had to have been the hardest time to start a small independent brewery in New Zealand. The reason it's important is because in 1976 New Zealand had become a duopoly. There was Lion and there was DB. I guess sort of in in 1980, the, the world was very black and white. You voted one or the other um, political party. You drank one or the other brewery's beer. He saw there was room to create an alternative, and that was Max. I think the thing that inspired Dad um, initially was he was looking around for another business opportunity. He had run, owned and run a couple of pubs, and um, that thing in his head about these big breweries obviously have a reasonably good business. They've got most of the outlets tied up in the country. Uh, they dictated the, uh, what was to be poured on the tap. Um, customers got what they were given rather than um, the customer given a choice. But he went over to a three week course in the UK and while he was over there he met up with Jim Pollock and they had a chat about various things and talked about the landscape out here, I guess, in the, in the pub game. Yeah, so that's where it started, that visit to the UK and meeting up with Jim for a chat. My role was really to make beer for the market and uh, we, we looked at the brewery and decided to actually construct it first. And we had tanks coming from, I think, Tararua Dairy uh, pumps coming from all over the place, all second-hand stuff. Uh, Terry had a mash tun made, um, and uh, we managed to get brewing quite early in the piece, um, and made improvements as we went on. 
we started buying up bits and pieces even before we had a property um, that had come up on the market second hand. There was a lot of auctions back then in the dairy industry, so there was a lot of tanks and pumps, etc. I remember as a kid going around to those. We had discussions, I think it was in the Ruther, Rutherford Hotel, and uh, we wondered how we, what we were going to do, and uh, the purity laws entered into it then, and I said I would like to brew to that because it would be a change for New Zealand to have to work. And as far as we knew, no one else was doing it. So this is how we started off. Pure malt, pure hops, good clean water, and a nice imported yeast. To get the uh, brewer's licence back in the day, uh, well, 1980, was <laughs> a lot slightly more difficult um, than anticipated, not because of the complexity of it, it's just that they were meant with blank stares basically and people who didn't know how to answer the question and there were no forms around for it. There hadn't been an application for over 30 years um, prior to that so any knowledge had well gone and um, Dad had to get a lot of help from the then local MP I recall was Doug Kidd uh, I was too old, and um, and so Terry had to sort of, uh, well, he had to fight on our behalf. In spite of having lived here, and our daughter was born here, um, the immigration at that time was pretty tight. And being over the age, he had to uh, pull a few strings, like speaking to the local MP, I think. And, uh, and eventually, they, he said he wouldn't do the job unless he got a, a good brewer. And he seemed to pick on me to be a good brewer. Fortunate for us. The immigration side of things was quite tough for Jim to come out too, and Dad had to have asked Doug Kidd as well to help us with that aspect, and he was in there doing quite a bit of work. So um, there are good MPs around. Um. And I'd come from a background, a uh, very varied background, um, starting off in, in England with my training and producing English type beers and then going to South Africa and producing lagers and, um, and then wandering from South Africa to New Zealand to the Tui Brewery which was a different beer again that, that's when Tui was independent it was quite a different beer and from there to Lyon from Lyon to Carlsberg and then after 10 years with Carlsberg, I saw an opportunity of coming back here. And here I am, here to stay. The, the yeast came with me in 1981. I bought it from Britain on, uh, on slopes in a vacuum flask with ice in there. It was a bit difficult on an overnight stop, but we did have a fridge in the hotel room. And then when we arrived here, I went down the road and bought a home brew kit and got the yeast going in the kitchen. And there we just kept feeding it. But having come from an overseas lager brewery, I wanted to start off with a lager. And that was the birth of gold. But then uh, there were thoughts of a dark beer, something like a well-known stout. And so we sort of compromised and produced black mac which was that type of beer. And uh, to make my job easier, which was the brewing, um, we also wanted to produce an ale. And it was a very simple thing, just to blend two items together, lager and dark beer to make an ale. And that's how we carried on for quite some time. It wasn't easy for him by a long stretch. Both the main breweries opposed him in many ways. Uh, they made it hard for him to get bottles. They made it hard for him to get grain. They found it so hard that they were actually buying their bottles out of Korea. They couldn't buy bottles locally to bottle their beer. The, the bottles was a bad, a naughty one, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, it did. Yeah. They learnt the hard way that uh, they, you can't block. It. I mean, there are other ways of doing anything. Yeah. Block one way, you go another way. Yeah. And that was a good choice, that. It's a good bottle. Excellent bottle. 
is still used, isn't it? And they came up with the, the famous ridged bottle uh, of, the, of the 1980s, which a lot of people still remember now as a, a Max uh, brand, if you like, and it worked for them in that way. So by trying to cut them out of the market for bottles, both DB and Lion actually helped them separate themselves from the pack. The three main components, uh, well actually there's four good main components for making a really good beer is uh, a good yeast strain, malt, hops and as you know a good water source and we had um, those covered one way or the other but the malting company in New Zealand uh, was owned by Lion and DB and they owned it 50-50 and the whole uh, mandate of that plant was to supply grain at cost plus basis to the brewers and um, the cheaper the better. When a brewer came along such as dad and asked for a malt supply people were looking at each other going oh um, this is interesting okay as a new customer a third customer we will um, will supply you but of course the board of directors didn't like the idea of feeding a opposition brewery and so what they did is they couldn't outright refuse to supply but they hiked the price uh, I think it was four or five times more than um, it should have been um, I remember that being a real um, sticking point dad being dad didn't like that didn't have any way to move and, and um, decided to uh, build a plant in here and find someone who knew how to make malt and that's exactly what we did. If you go in and put the hard yards in then you ultimately, and, and you can sustain it, then you become successful like obviously the McCashins did. One of the other bizarre things that worked for Max uh, as they started to get a foothold in Auckland is that uh, again Lion and DB put pressure on publicans to jack up the price that they were selling Max thinking it would uh, deter people from buying it. In fact it had the opposite effect and people saw it as a super premium product that must be really good because it was priced so high. He had a really substantial effect on New Zealand. That was the beginning of the idea that various styles of beer could be made for various tastes uh, so that nowadays there are literally dozens and dozens of small breweries. But today we live in a, a much more colourful world and there's all sorts of wonderful beers with different styles and aromas and flavours and ingredients and, and um, yeah we have to give a lot of thanks to um, Terry McCashin. What Terry McCashin did was put his foot in the door and force it open and that allowed others to follow in behind him including in the 1990s, major influential breweries such as Emerson's, Harrington's, Tuatara, uh, Sunshine Brewery in Gisborne, and a host of others. And so they had all these challenges, but because they started when they did, they uh, cracked open the door, they, they put a wedge in, and they, they gave us all hope to, to get out there and to create something that, that didn't exist. Terry McCashin was certainly a pioneer and he deserves his place uh, as one of the most influential people in New Zealand's recent brewing history. Then to now, I think the difference is it doesn't come out of the end of a hose and there's a fantastic choice which people are now making. People didn't realise they wanted a change, but it sort of foisted on them with the opening of Max. There was a different taste on the market. And things just followed on.